So this is the two triangle form. And if I'm gonna go straight to the last page, just so you could look at the two triangles. So we've done a lot of work with really um, identifying the triangle of conflict in a way that is easy for people to learn the triangle of conflict. I know for myself, it took me about a year to uh, be able to uh, really work the triangles well. And it mostly was because it took me time to understand the difference between adaptive feeling and maladaptive feeling and inhibitory feelings. I really had to understand the flow of those feelings. And so with adaptive feelings right here, you know that is when you're able to experience and hopefully express an adaptive feeling, a feeling that is going to connect you with adaptive behaviors. Right, and so you, if you look at the emotion of sadness, if someone's able to experience sadness and to cry and to lean into someone for support, if the, it's, it's the expression of the emotion, but also the behaviors that are associated with the emotions that are so helpful. And so you want to be helping your patients really be able to understand what is an adaptive emotion and what are the adaptive behaviors associated with it. And I start with like the emotions that people have access to that they easily can experience and express. And, and I identify those with them first so that they can feel uh, just this uh, kind of strong, positive regard for their capacity to experience and express feelings. And I use uh, Yak Pang Sep's work uh, with identifying feelings. And so, you know, if I see that someone has a good sense of humor, that they're able to be playful, uh, that they're able to be sad, I immediately point that out to them and, and help them understand how well they are uh, with experiencing the specific feelings and I point out the behaviors that are associated with them. Then I begin to talk with someone about the feelings that are not so easy for them, the feelings that they're avoiding. And, 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 and once we're able to identify together, for instance, uh, that they're avoiding the emotion of anger, then I move up to the inhibitory affect pull, which is the anxieties here. And I help them understand that when there's an affect that they are experiencing avoidance toward, that they pull back from that affect with anxiety primarily, but also shame, sometimes guilt, disgust, and pain. And when people are phobic to emotion, it's easy for them to understand that instead of experiencing and expressing anger, they experience a high level of anxiety and pull back from that feeling. And, and then I'll talk to them about how on the anxiety pull, that when an inhibitory affect becomes too uncomfortable, then it activates their defenses. And I do a really good job of pointing out how defenses can be both helpful and hurtful. And it just depends on the situation and who they're working with in terms of like whether or not a defense is helpful or hurtful. And, and then I'll help them begin to understand what defenses they have like with the specific emotion. So there's a lot of like psychoeducation with um, the triangle of conflict when you first introduce it to a person. But if you do focus in on what they are able to experience and express, it makes it a lot easier to start talking about the affects that they're avoiding and that they're pulling back from and they're activating defenses. And essentially, you know, when anxiety is really high and defenses are really high, it doesn't allow a person to feel connected with themselves or connected with others. And then that's when we shift to the triangle person, right? So, you know, when, when someone's able to identify an affect that they are avoidant with, that they have a phobic reaction, it really is helpful to begin to ask them, well, where did your avoidance of this specific emotion come from, right? If, if you're born with the capacity to experience these emotions and to access these positive behaviors, then, then where, where did you learn to, to move away from them? And, and you just start to um, talk with your uh, patient about the past. You know, what, what emotions were uh, they able to experience and express in uh, their childhood homes? Uh, and what emotions were they not able to experience and express? 
And if, if today they are still avoidant of some of those feelings, you know, a lot of people have worked through feelings that they were not able to experience in the past. And it's important that you identify that like, oh, you know, in their family of origin, they weren't able to be playful, but they are playful now, right? And, and so you want to look for what they are able to experience, experience and express, how they have healed, right? And then you want to look at the current poll and, and understand that when it comes to emotions, uh, who in their life right now uh, either helps them experience and express their emotions in, in a healthy way or prevents them, right? And so uh, you help them begin to understand who they can be themselves with who they can feel connected and, uh, and experience uh, you know, emotions and life with and who they find they need to pull back from. And an important thing to keep in mind is that past figures are also current figures. So a person's mother when they were five years old is very different than a person's mother when they're 50 years old. And, and, and it's important to like help people understand that uh, you know, people do change. And and uh, and our relationships with them change, and it's and it's useful to know what those changes are, particularly with emotions. And then here we go to the uh, therapist poll, and 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 you get to like talk with your patient about well, what what emotions are they able to experience with me? What emotions are they not able to experience with? And then you have to think of all the therapeutic people in their lives, because you want your, the person that you're working with to have a team of people who are therapeutic with them uh, professionally, but also personally, right? Who in, the, who in their life is helping them uh, be connected with themselves and, and to connect it with others. And, uh, and so, this is just how I introduce this form uh, to my patients. We just do a quick discussion around the triangle conflict, a quick discussion around the triangle person. And I ask them to kind of write in, uh, you know, uh, past people, current people, therapeutic people. And, uh, and then I ask them to do the same with uh, the feelings. Uh, you know, what affects do they have access with? What how are they pulling back from affects that they are avoiding? And what defenses are they activating? And, uh, and so if you think in terms of awareness, like the more your patient is able to be aware of how they're operating emotionally, the, the more they're going to be able to engage in creating change. And so, you know, awareness equals change in, in my mind. And so then you just kind of come up here to uh, the first part of the form. And, uh, and this is like, you know, these questions are really important to the work that we do. It's, it's you helping people be able to identify what problems they want to resolve. And you want to help the person be very behavioral, right? Like if somebody says, well, you know, um, um, I, I'm depressed all the time. You want to challenge them on that and just say, is that really true? You know, how, how long have you been depressed? You know, or is it situational? Uh, you know, who are you experiencing depression with? And so you ask them to identify like what problems they want to resolve, right? And then what's really important is ask them to identify an example of a problem that they want to resolve, right? And so every problem comes with an example. The example is really important because like when someone identifies a problem with an example, right away you're able to see them uh, activate their inhibitory affects. You might see some defenses come through or you might see a lot of connection inside of them. And then you want them to begin to talk about emotional conflicts. What, what affect phobias uh, exist for them? You know, do they have blocks to anger? Do they have blocks to sadness? Do, do they have blocks um, to uh, closeness? Right. And then finally, a core conflict formulation. And that's just, you have them come up with a hypothesis about their triangle of um, conflict and their triangle of person and, uh, and, and have them write, write it down. Now, I wanna say like when I share this form with people, some people ignore it altogether. Some people fill it out so that everything is filled in. 
uh, and some people just use um, bits and pieces of it. And I, I'm okay with that. I, I feel like the forum is more of a guide for them to just begin to be thinking about identifying their problems, coming up with examples of their problems, knowing like what their emotional conflicts are, what their core conflicts are, and to get a better sense of uh, you know, their triangle person and triangle of conflict. And so, you know, ju just this last week when I had somebody who was uh, really stuck on, on the defensive pole with a lot of like obsessive compulsive features, what, what I kept on doing over and over again is just helping them see how they were being obsessive, how they were being compulsive, and how when they were being that way, they weren't experiencing connection inside them and they weren't able to experience connection with me. And by gently pointing that out and just helping them see, you know, painting a picture that, that allowed that person to really get in touch with uh, a, a deep-seated grief that came from the past, right? And, and then they were able to connect it to grief that they were experiencing in the present time. And so it was like my ability to just notice that they were in a defended position and to help them engage in that awareness, help them just get more connected with themselves and, and have like an emotional breakthrough. And so, you know, for me, especially during uh, the pandemic, when I'm working primarily on Zoom, this form it just helps me keep track of where people are on a week to week basis or a month to month basis. But it's also something that I know that they could take home with them and they can work on their own, especially if they're, if they're feeling stuck. It seems rich because I'm, I'm someone who I'm trying to move more and more into emotion focused therapy and, and, and quite intrigued and curious by this model. My home based model is acceptance and commitment therapy, which I feel like is a nice. Yeah. 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 Amazing so. model. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I feel like this is just just rich. I'm just so excited. I feel like this is just rich with possibility and potential, and and um, I'm 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 honing in on. I'm curious. I really like this question. It says, "What feeling would be constructive?" I just really am eager to begin asking that question. I've never asked that question. It seems like a a guiding kind of question. If someone would ask me that, if I was in a dysregulated state, and if someone asked me that, that would be so grounding, I think, to be asked that question. It changed everything for me. Just asking someone, is this emotion constructive or destructive? It, it helps the person identify if it's an adaptive emotion or, or maladaptive emotion, because you have to keep in mind that you know, all emotions can be on the defense pole too. And I, uh, you know, something that I learned from Happy Davenlu is just asking someone uh, whether or not they're being emotionally honest with themselves. And so you can like ask someone to be emotionally honest with themselves and then scoot in, you know, is this emotion adaptive or, or maladaptive? And it really helps them identify the truth. So I'm looking forward to experimenting with these questions and because I'm already wanting to be the balance of the act model, which isn't, I mean, they, they, they integrate emotions, but, but it's very CBT like. And, and so this will help me to bring more of an emotional language into my questions. So, yeah. so I'm really looking, it'll complement the work I'm doing. So I'm really looking forward to experimenting. Right here, like all of you are my team right now. I mean, I'm, I'm like experiencing a tremendous amount of like warmth and excitement and, and like healthiness just by being here with you. And, and so, you know, the therapeutic people, like I'm always trying to help the people that I work with to increase the therapeutic people in their lives. And that, that's both on the uh, therapist poll, but also on the current poll too. And then with the past poll, and I'm helping them identify the people who have been there for them too. You know, when, when they were children, good coaches that they had or teachers who really believed in them. And, uh, and so, you know, what can happen for a person is they begin to see that they have a team from the past, a team in their current life, right? And then a therapeutic team that, that's uh, really helping them kind of uh, navigate the waters of life. Yeah. And 
in AEDP, we're constantly, you know, like looking around for the glimmers and the transformance drivings. And any, any time somebody mentions those people, you can feel like these huge, positive, affective, you know, strivings come up. Right, right. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Judy, because when that happens for someone, it's really important that you ask them, how are they experiencing that positive affect in their body? And, and try to help them experience that positive affect as long as they possibly can. And, and then, you know, if you can um, get them to describe out loud, like, oh, this is how it feels when I'm talking about this person who is so meaningful to me and so helpful to me. If you can ha help them describe like there's tingling in their body, there's like strength in their arms, there's, a, you know, a lot of joy in their face, then they can actually memorize those sensations. And after a session, they can think of that person, try to connect with those sensations again, and really work on internalizing that person in their lives so that they are holding that person, you know, within them w without thought down the road. Uh, it, it's, it's like they, that person can come, become a part of them. Kristen, I'm wondering if, um, so, like, uh, some people, you know, depending on where they are in the scale, the spectrum of resistant to fragile, you know, a lot of the resistant folks don't have access to their body, you know, and they're like, I don't know. Yep. Are you feeling? I don't know. I don't know. So, you know, it, it's great to go into all this detail, but like, you know, you're met with like blank stares, you know, any, any thoughts on how to kind of get them beyond that? Because <laughs> that's hard. Yeah, I, I'd be curious to see what other people do. Uh, you know, I, I tend to be very gentle with the I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I ask them out loud. And I'm also asking myself at the same time, like, you know, what, what is it like just to be here with me right now? Right? What, what is it like to tell me that you don't know right now? And I try to like see if they can begin to just simply describe what they're experiencing in the moment with me with their I don't know, right? Yeah. And then and then I'll you know if they're able to to talk about that and to describe what it's like to just be in a place of I don't know with me, then I kind of like circle back and say, so a part of you does know. Like, you know what it's like to be here with me right now. You are able to describe that in detail. And so we have to give you credit for knowing more than you, than you thought you knew, right? Because I, I mean, I know that a lot of people are cut off from their emotions. They're not able to identify it. But sometimes, like, within the therapeutic relationship, they can talk about just what it's like being in the room with me. And, and then I, I go out of my way to validate the fact that they, they know a lot more than, than they realize. And I, I believe that, you know, I, I think that we don't, at least here in the United States, we don't live in a culture where people are really identifying like what they truly are experiencing in the moment. They're, they're able to like say the right thing socially, right? How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I noticed that someone asked me how, how I am and I say, well, I'm a little bit sad today and uh, I had a rough morning. Most people tend to shy away from me when I give too much detail. So, you know, culturally, you know, we, we just haven't been trained to really identify how we're doing. And so it takes some time to, to do that. And Jonathan, I heard you say yes. And so do you have something that you want yeah, to share? I, I think, um... Some of our previous therapists are, as we had um, Michael Alperton and yeah. Rob Naborski, and they're just they're so expert at doing this um, of slowing it right down, of um, purposely misattuning. If the person is very, I don't know, doing what you're doing, Christian, they saying, well, like, it sounds like you've, you've given evidence there that lots of things you do know, and yeah, you explained it so well to me, and I really understand it. So you're getting the connection with the person amplifying it um maybe from a very depressed un unplugged place to a to a connected and um but i really understand i hear what you're saying is this and um and uh and michael alpert also in his videos um with clients he, he asked people to go watch the videos um, and i would do the same i'd ask the clients to go back and watch the videos and look for any times where they might you know bite their thumb or chew on their inner um cheek or um 
or scratch themselves and say, okay, well, have a look and see if there's times where you're holding yourself back when your body's saying, I know that I'm feeling emotion coming up, that I'm feeling anxiety. And have a look and, and, and maybe next time you can, we can look at the clip together and see if you can identify where your body really wants to talk, but you're, you're holding yourself back. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic reminder. Like when people do look at videotapes of their psychotherapy, it's so important for them to pay attention to like what they are experiencing non-verbally, mm -hmm. right? And to be open that their non-verbals have a lot of information that can help them understand how they're feeling. Uh, one, one other technique that I do is uh, when someone says, I don't know, I will often say like something like, oh, you know, that, that's really too bad that you haven't learned how to pay attention to yourself. Okay. And I, I wonder where you learned that from. And that, that puts us on the triangle of person. Yeah. I, I, I wonder where you learned your I don't know. Who, who wasn't paying attention to you? Who wasn't listening to you? Who wasn't hearing you? Are you curious? Uh, about what you'd like, would you like to know what you're feeling? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Because that's like, are you, are you motivated to, to, to learn? Right? Are you? Is, is are it you one of the reasons, it? isn't it one of the reasons you're here is to learn about yourself and have a better connection with yourself and more understanding of yourself. Yeah. So are you curious? The other thing I will do is just point out, gosh, this is pretty much straight Davin Lou too, but, um, gosh, um, if you don't know, we're not going to be able to go anywhere, right? We're going to just be stuck. We're not going to be able to move any place. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to go back to something that came up to me when you guys were talking about questioning whether this affect, an affect is adaptive or, or uh, unadaptive. I think there was a sort of Constructive or destructive, helpful or hurtful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's sort of an implication there that uh, we can choose our feelings. Mm -hmm. And um, I, one of the things I don't like sometimes about cognitive behavioral therapy is, as Paul Wachtel says, it's a way we try and talk our patients out of their feelings. Mm. Um, and that's a misalliance with ourself. So I'm, I'm a little concerned if you would ask somebody, would you like to be feeling this or not like to be feeling this? Is this a helpful feeling or not a helpful feeling that that might contribute to this idea of you can choose your feelings or you should choose your feelings or you, mm. a, a good person would be able to choose their feelings. And I'm wondering if you run up against that and if so, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I, you know, I think that I do a really good job of helping people understand that, you know, with feelings is to experience the feeling and or express the feeling. And so it's all about internal experience. And so it's more like with curiosity, like if you're experiencing sadness right now with me, right, do you find that sadness to be helpful to you? Right? Or do you find it to be hurtful? So for instance, if somebody is angry at another person and they're crying and, and they're feeling sad, but not angry, Right? It, it, it's helpful to ask, like, is this sadness helpful to you right now? Is the sadness, you know, helping you? Mm. And, and, and I, I'm shocked by how easily people could say, like, well, no, I've cried about this person a thousand times and it's gotten me nowhere, right? And then that would be the moment that perhaps the sadness isn't helpful in that moment, you know, and that they need to you know, be open to experiencing other feelings towards that person. So, you know, in my world, it's all about complex feelings. It's like, you know, um, can someone experience closeness and sadness and, and anger and rage toward, toward a specific person? And I really pay attention to when they're only experiencing one emotion toward a person versus all emotions. Because typically in a healthy relationship, you have access to all emotions you know, sometimes throughout the day or throughout the week or throughout the month. So it's not about like picking the right emotion. It's more about like, what are you experiencing inside? And is this emotion helpful to you at this moment? So, hey, Kristen, I have a question. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because I'm thinking of our our former speaker when you when you had Hillary on. Yeah, Hillary. The yeah. ADP model. Yeah. And she had her own triangle. And um, yeah. and so so far, what I my mindset now, or or since then has been that we that she talked about accessing core emotions. Yeah. So, yeah. and I thought sadness was a core emotion. And so now I, I'm hearing you saying that sometimes accessing a core emotion is not always helpful. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. So great question, oh, so Michael. You just have to keep in mind that all emotions can be helpful, right? And all emotions can be hurtful. It really depends on the circumstance and the person in that moment, right? So, you know, it is... If, if I'm angry at someone and I'm crying over them, then sadness is not my core emotion. It's, it's the anger is my core emotion with that specific person, right? But, but I'm, I'm avoidant of anger. And so therefore, um, I, I'm, I'm pulling back and I'm experiencing the sadness instead. So, and I, I think that reading Hillary's book is really important and, uh, and we'll be sure to put out a link uh, for her book uh, um, in, in the next email that you received for, for the August meeting. And then I also wanna go back to Bruce and you had mentioned the Davenlu uh, technique and can you just remind me out loud, Bruce, what you said? Cause I thought there was something important for us to-, to would, you, would, would, you like to would you like to know what you're feeling? Are you curious about that feeling? Yeah. Yeah. Would you, would you like to have more awareness of your feeling? Right. Another, another um, more heavier intervention when someone, well, I don't, know, I don't know if I want to share this or not, but, you know, sometimes you can say to someone, uh, I don't, I'm not feeling anything. Well, you, we only, the only time we don't feel anything is when we're dead. Um, I, I think that can be a little heavy with people sometimes, but just, you know, would you like to know? Um, Right. Are you curious about it? Um, I like what you said earlier about that's a certain disconnection from yourself and uh, that, that you could, again, look, is it hurtful to you or helpful to not know about what's going on? One thing I say to people sometimes is if we don't know how to use our legs, we're going to have trouble walking. Mm -hmm. If we don't know how to manage our emotional life, we're going to have trouble living and knowing who we are and what we want and so on. That's beautiful. And, and, um, yeah. And I don't think it opens great doors for people, but at least it gives a little bit of insight. Um, I, I, want, I think I want to say one other thing about my colleague from Ohio. By the way, Michael, I'm from Ohio too, so uh, I live in California now. But <laughs> um, uh, to me, the question of honesty, you know, if you're crying at someone you're angry at, that's certainly dis there's a certain way that's dishonest, or we mm -hmm. think of that as a not a sadness is a can be a core affect, but in this instance, it's a it's a defense against another affect that the person is afraid of. So you want to really identify what the real affect is and help the person experience that um, rather than. Thank you, sorry. thank you, Bruce. And Thank you, Michael. And I, I, we have to begin to end today, but I think all of us ought to be grabbing Hillary Jacob Handel's book and reading more about affect. It's going to be so helpful to us. And Magna, that's a great book to recommend to physicians with physician self-care too. It's really easy to read and, and learn more. So um, now we're, we're at the end. Thank you everyone for coming today. We'll see you in August.